Well, we keep each other in check here. <laughs> if it was a pilot, we would have forgot to switch fuel tanks here. We would have had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> So get us started. <laughs> we'll start over again. Um, this is Faisal Saleh, um, founder and executive director of the Palestine Museum US in Woodbridge, Connecticut. Uh, it's very sunny and beautiful today, but it's 24 degrees Fahrenheit, um, very chilly. And uh, we're uh, delighted today to uh, kind of uh, shift gears a bit and uh, um, and switch to the more artistic, uh, musical side of things. Um, nonetheless, it's about Gaza, and uh, uh, it's an industrial, industrial strength uh, dose of Gaza that we will get today. Um, so um, I would like to ask uh, my co-host, uh, Krista, who reminded me to make sure we turn the recording on, and for that much, I'm very appreciative. And uh, Krista, give us an introduction, and then we'll be underway shortly. Okay, sounds good. I'm Krista Brune. I'm a programming volunteer with the Palestine Museum U.S. Tuning in from Madison, Wisconsin. This is Ho-Chunk country, land of the four lakes, known as Dejok in Ho-Chunk language. And I'm honored to welcome David Rovix, uh, who's a songwriter and musician and writer and podcaster based in Portland, Oregon, where he's tuning in from today. Uh, since the 1990s, David has been touring regularly throughout North America. Europe and occasionally elsewhere, playing on stages large and small at protests and festivals, as well as in squatted social centers and folk clubs. He's recorded dozens of albums and has millions of his songs streamed every year. His writing and podcasting can be found on Substack and other platforms. Uh, David also plays music for kids. And uh, I know you had a concert last night. I'd like to hear more about that. And also tell us, how did you get into music? How did you first pick up that guitar and get inspired to share your voice with the world as a maker of change? Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on the, on, in the, in the, the webinar, I guess we're calling it with the webinar still, are we? This is, <laughs> um, I, uh, my parents are both musicians. Um, every side of every side of my family are all musicians. So it was inevitable to become a musician. It's a, not, not a very interesting origin story. You know? <laughs> Just, uh, you know, I did not fall far, far from the tree. Um, uh, the gig, uh, last night, uh, the, the event went really well, despite the fact that the whole city is like kind of a sheet of ice right now. And you know, we don't have snow plows in Portland, you know, so when it snows, the whole city shuts down, but we, we had 50 people come out. So I was, uh, I was happily Wonderful. Uh, impressed. Uh, yeah. Um, but, um, I mean, one thing that's very clear is there's just, a you know, uh, a lot of interest you could say in in this issue you know i mean i've been finding that just over the past few months of uh as i've been trying to document the genocide in gaza and, and writing uh, songs i guess 21 songs so far since october uh and uh, i find that there's just people everywhere are are feeling the same way and, and trying to do whatever it is they can possibly think of to do that's uh might somehow raise awareness or or have any kind of possible impact and you know all the while i think mostly knowing that uh you know the bombs are just are going to keep falling i mean that's just um you know for if i had any hair to pull out it would be have been pulled out you know by now what was actually the first song that you wrote about gaza and how did that come to you well on, i know you wrote something cycle... about palestine back some years ago, but in, in this iteration of yeah. since October 7th. And this since October 7th, um, I mean, after October 7th, I, I wrote a, well, on October 7th, I think it was, I wrote a essay um, in Counterpunch, um, uh, just making the, I think, fairly obvious comparison between uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and, and uh, tell, you know, talking about that you know this uh, what happened as as a ghetto uprising not, not it's it's what's not a war between two countries this is a ghetto uprising from people living in a walled in a ghetto that had been you know prevented from importing or exporting goods or people for you know the past you know many many years since you know so uh the i wrote a bunch of essays and um and then i switched gears and started writing songs after i 
pretty much felt like I had said everything I had to say, you know, in essay form on, on, on tackling different angles of what was going on. And, and on October 13th, I wrote uh, As the Bombs Rain Down, which was the first of the songs. In now, the Krista, series. why don't we... Um, let, let's yeah, talk. why don't we play that? That would yeah. be a good one yeah. to share so, with our um, audience. Uh, kick us off here. If you can, uh, I enabled you to be able to share screen. So if you like to share screen and play it from your side, that would be great. Uh, let's see. Me? Uh, let's see. How, how I don't, how do I share screen? Let's see. I'll, uh, I'll click on the that. Green, and... The green arrow in the bottom. Do, I, do I find the video first and then do that? Or? Uh, Find the video first and have the video queued on this on your screen first. Okay. And um, all right, it's ready to go. Uh, now, when you okay. click the green screen, there are two buttons you have to click. Also, one that in the bottom of the the screen, one that says share audio and optimize video. Do you see them in the bottom of the screen of the sharing screen? Bottom a share screen and then then I oh optimize for video yeah. clip. Yeah, and then share audio next to it. It's not letting me click on that optimize thing for some reason. Okay, just do the share audio. See if let, would it let you do the share audio? Not letting me click on that either. Okay, so um, you probably have some share? permission situation. Uh -huh. Um, it's not asking you for permission or anything. So let me uh, let me see if I um, I may have that on my side here. And uh, uh... but it says now that I'm screen sharing. Should I try playing it and see what happens? Uh, yeah, we're sure. not. Here. Yeah, just so try try. Here's the song. So and then yeah, if it is trying. Is that coming up? No. Yeah. No. We see so it. Let's see if the sound. But we don't hear it. No, the audio is not coming through because of that button is not enabled. Okay, so let me uh, oh. um, let, let me do something here. Um, one second, just bear with me for a moment. Uh, this song is called what? As the, the bombs bomb, rain down. Uh, as the bombs rain as down. As the bombs rain down. Uh, Track number one in that folder I sent you. Yeah, so let me let me go and download it. It only takes me a minute. You guys chat for a minute here. Okay. Otherwise, I have the folder open too. If I saw, if you want me to try, um, I know you're more savvy at this than I am. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna play it from my side then. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the Zoom. Um, for your patience, everyone. I'm gonna stop the sharing here. Uh, no oh, more. we're still on David's screen. Yeah, I I, I got rid of it. So not to worry. Okay. And uh, so we're about to hear uh, David Rubik's first song that he was inspired to write after October seventh. It, it's not it's letting me do as, that either. It's not letting me as do the it. The bombs rain, rain down. That's I strange. I hope it's not a copyright issue. Let me just uh, deal with it. Let me download it and see if if we still have a problem with the downloaded version. That's so uh, bizarre. Mm. And as the and we'll download it here. Let's give it a second. And almost there. Yeah, that may be that it needs to be on okay. here. Okay, so um, yeah, bear with me here. Apologize for this delay here. It's a, 
Um, it's live. That's what we always say on radio whenever there's uh, some kind of a glitch. You know, this is, this is live yeah. radio, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is really how it goes. Yeah, yeah. All right, for so. the for the spiffy, you know, eloquent, you know, that's all edited later. You know, that's a post production. <laughs> you know, that's right. We get to see all the all the challenges that we face with technology that's, that's along the right. way. I always say technology is great as long as it works. <laughs> exactly. There's something about this that I'm I'm not going to get the audio either, probably. Because are you hearing any audio? Oh, there we go. Yes. Yeah. All right. But okay, I think so it's running through some kind of horrible filter. No. Sounds okay. like there's some kind of compressor going on. Oh, no, 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 that's terrible. Hear the drones above your head. What were the last words that she said before she joined the thousands dead as the bombs rained down? See the fire in the sky, hear all of the children cry. The tower falls from way up high as the bombs rain down. See the dust rise everywhere, once it was a building there. Then it crashed down from the air as the bombs rain down. Twisted bodies all around, the never-ending buzzing sound The earthquake shaking all the ground as the bombs rain down Shattered camps of refugees, necklaces of ancient keys Smell the burning olive trees as the bombs rain down See the homes, apartment blocks, see the mosques reduced to rocks Feel the awe and feel the shock as the bombs rain down See the sewage in the street, mixed with blood beneath your feet Before the sonic boom repeats as the bombs rain down See the darkness of the night, no power for the lights, but the explosions are so bright as the bombs rain down. Nothing left but rubble strewn, nothing rising but the moon, but the next one's coming soon as the bombs rain down. Hear the politicians say there's nothing here to see today We're punishing Hamas this way as the bombs rain down Hear the drones above your head, what were the last words that she said Before she joined the thousands dead as the bombs rain down Okay Wow, well, uh, it's a powerful song, I mean, you just so precisely address so many issues that are relevant to what's happening there on the ground and also invoking the, the first Nakba back in 48 with, with the ancient keys. And, oh, it's just, it's just really, uh, really incredible. I think the way you so concisely in, in a song can um, help people really appreciate what uh, what suffering people are going through and, and the way you end it with what were the last words that she said. I think we, we, it's so important to actually, you know, paint the humanity of the of what's going on and you know try to counter the Western propaganda about the so-called Israel-Hamas war and all this kind of nonsense. You know, this is a genocide that's being carried out. And, you know, if you're not West, if you're watching the, you know, Western media, overwhelming majority of the main Western media, you know, stations and radio and news outlets and all that, you're just going to get a completely propagandized version of reality that really doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, you know, tell us what's, what's going on. And you know, it, it needs to be countered in as many possible ways, you know, as, as it, as can be. And, and uh, songs are w one of those ways that, uh, that I think uh, are a very important way to, 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 uh, communicate about what's going on in the world and and it, and it always has been of course you know people you find that the demonstrations around the world uh, you know including throughout the arab world you know of course music is central to what's going on as well uh, you know it is, it is it is a form of communication and inspiring people to action and to you know just uh, you know having a sense of community i mean music is, is central to that sort of thing but I, I think, yeah, with this song, it was uh, what I wanted to really communicate was that 
this is um, this is what's going on. This is a genocidal bombing campaign. This is not a, you know, that's what it is. So what do we do? And that whole experience of, of living in, in darkness. Yeah, if you listen to the media, mm. you would just have, uh, you just think, think everything is justified um, instead of seeing, you know, the human side of, of what's happening. Yeah, you, you, and justified is is the way they would uh, they they put it. It's it's like a playground kind of um, a sort of uh, logic. Like uh, he pushed me, and so I pushed him back harder. You know, it's that kind of that's the kind of. I mean, I as a parent, I'm just appalled at at the level of sort of emotional maturity that is being sort of expressed with with these kinds of so-called arguments you know like, what this is really your argument he pushed me and i pushed him back and and, he, and and history began on october 7th and nothing happened before then that's that's how we're really supposed to understand this well and really that sense of the strength to do it and they um you know it being sanctioned by the united states and other western countries and um you know justified over and over again and and that the, the empty words of, of, you know, expressing concern for the loss of life in Gaza, which we you know is not genuine, because we know that these these governments, especially the United States, could stop what's happening in the blink of an eye. Absolutely. And chooses not to, and that's... Um, so tell me about how it feels to, you know, people all around the world are using their voice to draw attention to the situation, calling for a ceasefire, uh, um, you know, a, speaking to the humanity of the situation and the inhumanity of the way it's been dealt with by our world leaders. Uh, this is your way of, of, you know, getting your voice out there. Just talk a little bit about how that feels as a songwriter to get your voice out there. And then we'll, we'll listen to another song. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, I think uh, as a songwriter, I imagine for uh, people out there who are uh, whatever it is that you do, I, I imagine that you can relate to what I'm about to say, because, um, you know, the reality that we're in, in terms of like those of us who are creating content of one kind or another, whether it's songs or films or any number of other things um, is uh, it's a very it's it's really a very isolated uh, reality you know sitting in the living room with a, a laptop and watching news programs about things that are happening on the other side of the world and then writing about it you know from my living room here in Portland it's very disconnected and strange and and I you know I can I can uh, I've been to the places that I'm writing about so that helps a lot uh, to to be able to um, you know, imagine and, and to, you know, but it's, uh, it only feels connected when I'm actually out there singing at protests and, and um, it w which only happens when I go to Europe, you know, for, for one reason or another. But um, that's, uh, that's when, when being a musician is really what it is supposed to be, where you're actually playing for human beings that you can see in front of you that can sing along with your songs. And that's, that's a, that's a wonderful experience, but, um, uh, in spite of the in spite of the subject material, and I, I think um, you know people can, the lots of people can understand and, and and agree with this idea that even if you're singing about the most horrible things that are happening now or historically, or you know, um, if you are expressing what people are feeling already, and you and and they're thinking, you know, for the, all the people out there, and there are millions and millions of us around the world who are obsessively, constantly thinking about this genocide and can't think about anything else, um, you know, for all those millions of people, you know, it, if they some those who do get a chance to hear um, my songs or other songs that are about what's going on, you know, I think um, you know that that sort of do a good job of of, of expressing uh, what people are feeling. Then then it's a it's a good you know it's a, it's a you know a positive experience for people because people need their their uh thoughts and feelings sort of put into into words like that into, into words into yeah sometimes Krista, it's hard to put things into words yeah Krista, i'm gonna ask uh, david a question david um sure uh, who who do you think um your audience is uh yeah that's a that's a i i, I love that question and then and, and because um, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, a simple answer. You know, it, it might have been a, a simpler answer in the days before the internet, when I was mainly uh, touring around uh, in the United States, and 
you know, then I would have said, you know, my audience are is, you know, mainly people in the US, but uh, that's changed over, you know, for for a long time now. And, and uh, you know, my audience is, is anybody who uh, who speaks English and um, and 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 even beyond that, you know, because we can sub uh, videos. But uh, I've sure. played a lot in countries where English is not, a, a, you know, a dominant language. And um, and I never you know, I, I find that, you know, basically people there is a society where where most people or a lot of people speak English is is the kind of place that I tend to, you know, actually return to physically and do gigs in and stuff like that. But it, but, but the audience on the internet is, is really un, unlimited. And like uh, in recent months, um, you know, although, although I would say that I'm really, you know, trying to reach uh, Americans and, and people from like pl places like the U S and the UK uh, specifically for political reasons, because these are the countries that are the biggest problem in the world and these are the countries that, that were, whose foreign policies desperately need to, to change uh, for the sake of humanity and domestic policies as well, for that matter. But um, sure. so I, I focus a lot on, on U.S. You know, imperialism and, and British imperialism and, and the history of that. And um, but uh, I, and, and I'm trying to appeal to Americans to, to and, and British people to understand their their country's policies and their histories so that people will hopefully you know, act on, on that knowledge. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to play the role of popular education here in, in the West, but at the same time, like, uh, you know, in the past few months, I'd say, you know, more people in the Arab world have probably heard the songs I've been writing um, than anyone else. And like the song uh, for uh, that I wrote about Ansar Allah, um, you know, that's been heard, I think, by hundreds of thousands of people in Yemen. And, and I think that's wonderful because I think it's important also for, people in places like Yemen to know that uh, in in the United States and elsewhere in the the West among these you know English speakers making videos and putting them up on YouTube there's a lot of uh, people who are just as concerned and, um you know and outraged by what's going on in Gaza as people are in Yemen you know and and I find you know from the all the feedback I've been getting by translating Arabic messages on X that I get because of that song it's it's very clear that you know people feel that way and part of that outrage is just the hypocrisy, which I think you address in the uh, in the song "Humanitarian Pause." Maybe we could listen to that, Faisal, if you sure. can get that in the queue. Uh, we have sorry, um, the, so the song "Humanitarian Pause." Why don't we take a listen to that? The next one. Uh, okay. Of course, yeah. Of I figured out the I figured out the problem we were dealing with, so let me try now this time. Okay. Uh, Great. So when, when you yeah. when you play it. Everybody mute your mics when you're playing the song, so then we won't hear okay. you drinking. They're all they're all muted automatically. Okay. So. And why don't okay. you uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, leading up to that song and, and what was humanitarian going as you wrote it? Yeah, I but mean yes, the, uh... the completely outrageous uh, that the the whole the whole idea that that we're gonna we're gonna take a break from this genocidal bombing campaign uh, to, uh, you know, for a, a little word from our sponsors. I mean, it's like an advertising break or something. And then we will resume the bombing afterwards. I mean, it's just completely uh, macabre and, and horrific. And, uh, and, and just, uh, and that's what happened. I mean, they took a few days off and then uh, just uh, right resumed. around Thanksgiving and Black Friday in, in the United States. If you're not tuning in from the United States, you may not know that our Black Friday is just this this uh, pressure to consume and, you know, it's probably the, the biggest shopping day of the year. And, and mm. so a lot of people actually boycotted that day for that very reason. So let's take a listen. Uh, hold on a second. Just bear with me. I forgot something. One second, please. Okay. After targeting emergency responders After blowing up the water tanks and fuel After bombing all the hospitals and ambulances After blowing up the mosques and the schools After bombing all the camps North and South 
The camps of new and former refugees After fighter jets with bunker buster missiles After navy ships shelling from the seas Now they'll take a little break from slaughtering the children Then they'll do it all over again Bombing all the solar panels After blasting apart a free street After leveling apartment blocks Turning them to dust When might they think the bombing is complete? After blowing up the churches and the parliament After killing families in their cars after killing families walking down the road With nothing in between them and the stars Now they'll take a little break from slaughtering the children Then they'll do it all over again After bombing their own prisoners Beneath the missiles dying there alone Who knows what might be their plan of attack As they kill off so many of their own After keeping food and water from the people After making sure all the injured die Along with all the babies in the incubators As everywhere the world wonders why as they'll take a little break from slaughtering the children Then they'll do it all over again After targeting emergency responders After blowing up the water tanks and fuel Well, you can just see how outrageous it is. You know, you go through all this destruction and then in the name, uh, using the word humanitarian is, is really a disgrace actually, because, you know, as the song says, you just take a break and start all over, you know. So guys, give, 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 me, um, and then, give me the next song yeah. so I can cue it while you're talking. Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, I don't know, Fire's David. Too much you have a... <laughs> um, well, no, I, I have a list here, but I'm just trying to. David, think why everybody. don't you suggest I... suggest the next? I one. would suggest uh, the the uh, the in the music video folder um, yeah. one called Airdrop. Airdrop. Okay, got it. But there's a there's two folders. There's one of videos and one music video. I, I know the one the one yeah, with okay. the airplanes flying yeah. in Berlin and all that. Yeah, I think that's. I uh, think I have I've yeah. already had that yeah, downloaded and... from before. And talk about the inspiration for that song, because of course that goes yeah. back to World War Two. Well, yeah, it, I mean, it. I mean, it. it the, the song does go back to World War Two, and and I'll just and then the campaign uh, basically for this. I mean, song the, for which I wrote the song um, basically started uh, a week before last Friday, and there, there's a wonderful uh, organizer around Palestine solidarity uh, for many long time now uh, Sarah Wilkinson in England who started this uh, mm -hmm. effort uh, along with lots of other folks around the world to get this uh, hashtag trending on X the uh, hashtag uh, uh, send um, uh, airdrop aid to Gaza a a airdrop aid for Gaza airdrop aid for Gaza yeah airdrop aid for Gaza I always yeah you, you got to get them right the hashtags right and if it's going to I know you can't just, that, not a variation <laughs> of it you know airdrop aid for Gaza some people are putting and, uh, airdrop for Gaza because exactly, they forget like, the floor but they're both like, out yeah. there right so yeah and of course but, this um, dates back to uh you know the the airdrop that Jordan the, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan did uh for their field hospital so tell us more about how exactly what you're hoping yeah, to get so, out of out of this campaign yeah, so the idea with the campaign and getting this hashtag trending was just to basically um, thank uh, King Abdullah for for the airdrops that have been uh, made uh, done so far and and to highlight the fact that these have happened because it's been 
I mean, whatever news source you follow, and I follow a whole bunch of them, I just somehow had not heard anything about these airdrops until um, until Sarah, uh, you know, invited me to this uh, chat room to to hear about this. But um, it, there's been seven of them. They've delivered a, a bunch, uh, many tons of aid and medical supplies and all that uh, to the Jordanian field field hospital uh, through this method, which at a time when 95 percent of Anything trying to come in by land has been uh, prevented from getting in uh, by the Israeli military. Um, you know the uh, the airdrops are uh, are at least some kind of a way to get uh, get uh, you know, desperately needed uh, aid in, and um, they did seven of them in collaboration with the French Air Force without any uh, you know problem uh, as far as like Israel trying to shoot down planes or whatever, and the air, the and the aid uh, got in and. Um, and the campaign is is basically trying to you know thank them for doing that and uh, and encourage them to do a whole lot more, and uh, sure <laughs> and, and so I, and then so then what happened was they they got the hashtag trending and then the next day Israel bombed the Jordanian field hospital, which was on the seventeenth of uh, January, which is terrifying, right? Here you have this incredibly powerful campaign, badly needed aid getting into Gaza, and then the very people who are putting their life on the line to support uh, this humanitarian effort are then targeted. Exactly. And of course, I mean, Israel has been very intentionally targeting hospitals, uh, you know, doctors, nurses, uh, ambulances, um, you know, and very specifically targeting journalists and, and specifically targeting civilians in order to kill as many of, as possible. You know, this is, it's, it's a, uh, I wrote a couple of songs on that. I mean, it's, it's uh, the concept of indiscriminate is, is a, uh, a little lacking, yes. you know, because it's very discriminating in a sense. They're discriminating against the entire population, but they're you know, also specifically aiming to assassinate certain members of them. I mean, more than 10 percent of the journalists uh, in Gaza have been killed. You know, Yes, well over 100 in, in as yeah. many days. It's it's really heartening. Exactly. And yeah, indiscriminate would be another great song to play after we hear airdrop. So, but then I airdrop. So I was, uh, you yeah. know, when I wrote the song, I mean, I was. So I then my idea for writing it was was just to, you know, think. I know because I had read about the Berlin airlift of 1948, 49, and uh, and you know, it, I think that the reasons why it happened are a lot less interesting than than the actual physical airlift itself. Because I mean, the the West Berlin never needed to get as to get isolated. I think it had a lot to do with. U.S. foreign policy in the first place, but anyway, aside, you know, so I don't want to paint the Soviet Union as the bad player in this, you know, necessarily historically. But that the history, that aspect of the history aside, the actual physical phenomenon of the airlift, I think, is so worth, uh, you know, remembering because what what went on was as West Berlin was relatively isolated from the rest of West Germany, uh, the U.S. and U.K. Uh, planes for over a year, uh, delivered over between five and 20,000 tons per day of food, mm -hmm. fuel, and uh, aid, you know, aid of all kinds into West Berlin, and completely, completely supplied by air, a city of 2.8 million people for over a year. Which is almost the same population, right? A little bit more yeah. than in Gaza. Yeah, mm -hmm. just a bit more than Interesting Gaza. Interesting comparison. Yeah. Very. Okay, let's, let's hear the song, guys. Go ahead, go for it. All right, there we're gonna share. And is this one here? No blockade was imposed, no one could come or go. And in order to successfully throttle off the flow of food and fuel and what's needed to survive to keep more than two million people alive the authorities limited imports to just a few tons that would be allowed to pass through to try to break the siege on the ground seemed impossible until the world heard the sound Watched the aviators streaking through the sky To try to find out how much cargo they could fly They drafted every plane that could be flown 
Determined not to leave these millions alone To be cold and hungry or else to be subsumed They said it was impossible An endeavor that was doomed Every 30 seconds a plane would fly away To deliver to those trapped 5,000 tons a day more than two million supplied by air alone Thousands of airdrops flown Watch the aviators streaking through the sky To try to find out how much cargo they could fly Planes crashed as they do a hundred people died But the flights kept coming No way to put aside The needs of all these people To have something to eat To have fuel and medicine And shoes upon their feet It was in West Berlin Way back when And it could all be done again to save the Gaza Strip Or forever wonder why we just let All the Palestinians starve and die Watch the aviators streaking through the sky To try to find out how much cargo they could fly You know, that song really just challenges the world, you know, to think outside the box of what is possible. Obviously, there have already been airdrops. Why not just increase that? Or even better, ask the question, why does Gaza need all this humanitarian aid in the first place, even before October 7th? That's, of course, the most powerful yeah. question and, and the unanswered question of, of, you know, blocking people in a small parcel of land uh, who whose homes are just across the border. It's it's really, uh, is that, we don't get to that part of the conversation, yeah. Um, it is ironic that uh, the people who are doing the airlift <laughs> are the people who are supplying the bombs and all the ammunition no to be used against Gaza. Not that they're not providing an airlift alone, but they're actually providing uh, the, the death planes. The death <laughs> the That's deeply ironic. Like, and, I mean, uh, you're talking about the is. French. You're talking about the French military in the case of Gaza, right? I mean, the, the the French were involved. The French Air Force and was involved with the Jordanians with this airlift, and yeah. France is also one of the world's biggest exporters of missiles. Yeah, but I mean, the U.S. is the one that did the airlift in Berlin. Right, and, right. Uh, they they did a different kind of an airlift here. The airlift was to Israel. Uh, bringing yeah. the bombs and the instruments of death that Israel needed to perfect their attack on Gaza and, and, and kill a lot of the people there. Uh, it, and that's even right. override and Congress was... to continue to supply that war machine. Exactly. But I think in the case of this idea of the airdrop, um, I think it's mm -hmm. a, there's another important parallel with um, with with the history there in in, in uh, with the with the Berlin airdrop, w which is that like there are possible alternatives uh, for com countries that are actually that might be possibly led by people that actually want to prevent this genocide or stop this genocide from continuing uh, that that perhaps there are alternatives to going to war with Israel you know um, perhaps and and perhaps one of those alternatives is to actually you know challenge Israeli, control of of the airspace over gaza by delivering airdrops and and then you know seeing what happened it's obviously what you know it's obviously a very extremely provocative thing to do from the perspective of uh, the israeli military but it's at least uh not uh like actually you know declaring war on israel so it, which is which is the kind of um the kind of quandary that was faced by the you know people in 1948 who launched the airlift uh, in Berlin. I mean, there were others who were advocating starting a war with the Soviet Union in order to get, you know, U.S. Uh, so, uh, and UAK, UK military supplies into West Berlin. And that was uh, that idea was uh, 
overruled by people that that uh, thought, well, let's just try delivering all the aid and, and see see you know what happens. Uh, David, what's the next well, song we, that you want? Yeah, the indiscriminate. Should... Since we mentioned that, yeah. I think that's another good one to listen to. Uh, from from the, the video uh, folder. Uh, the video folder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking for how far down is it? Oh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Near the end, it's all in order of when they were when they were written, <laughs> rather than yeah. alphabetically. Okay, so, so let's see. It's, uh, yeah, I actually 17. don't see it in the folder. It's 17. What oh, is there? 17. 17. 17. 17. All right, I got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys continue. Okay. Yeah. yeah so David, with this uh, air airdrop song, mm -hmm. well, yeah, maybe you want to talk about indiscriminate. I just also wanted to hear a little bit more about how you've um, mm. made some of these songs into like a video kind of a video like the one we just saw and, and I think that's really powerful to bring that imagery in into into I your think songs so too. as well. So. Yeah. And that's um and that's been I mean one of my experiences with the past three months is that there's so many people around the world wanting to do something uh and and uh, whatever they can think of to do and and one of those things has been uh like well that the, my my musical collaborator for the whole album has been offering his you know services for Free out in Hawaii where I've been sending him files and he's been adding all the instrumentation and everything. And there's a, a filmmaker in California who wishes to remain anonymous, who has been uh, m making uh, these videos for, uh, I think so far, five of the songs. Um, and uh, he's been doing that uh, just for the same reason as my friend Chet in Hawaii, just because uh, you, you know, you make make the music more interesting and we put videos to it, and and it's a, it'll reach a, a broader audience. And I think the sure, video and it that you did becomes a multi-sensory for... experience. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And the the one video for the song "Famine and Disease" that he did, I think, was probably my favorite of his uh, video efforts. And it was also used for trying to get that hashtag trending. Just um, that's what I got pinned on my X too, because I think this this whole. Um, warning that the UN uh, put out in you know so many times I think starting in October that you know if aid is not if, if food and medicine is and fuel is not allowed into Gaza then uh, but then the numbers of people killed uh, and injured by the bombing will be dramatically eclipsed by people dying from disease and starvation which is now that's happening. right all right shall we go to the next one sure and uh this is what's called indiscriminate. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, so here we go. They bombed the Jabalia camp once again. And once again, those killed are all women and children. No one can keep track of the numbers of dead. Find which torso belongs to which head. Bodies are lying in what's left of the streets. Sometimes someone covers them up with sheets. Surrounded by destruction wherever you look. No way to fathom all the lives that they took. They call it indiscriminate. Would be terrible if true. But they're targeting doctors, they're targeting patients, they're targeting journalists, they're targeting poets, they're targeting women, and they're targeting children, too. However this slaughter might come to an end, whoever remains alive to defend the right for a people to simply exist, whoever is still here to raise their fist will never forget the war that was waged on a city imprisoned by a gigantic cage An air force against the civilian homes of those not protected by the Iron Dome They call it indiscriminate It would be terrible if true But they're targeting doctors They're targeting patients They're targeting journalists They're targeting poets They're targeting women And they're targeting children too who will 
be left to remember those killed when the air is cleared from the smoke that filled the whole city with poisonous gas burning the skin off the children it passed turning whole towers into piles of rock as those watching tried to comprehend through the shock they just killed 70 members one family in this month of December they call it Indiscriminate would be terrible if true. But they're targeting doctors, they're targeting patients, they're targeting journalists, they're targeting poets, they're targeting women, and they're targeting children. Yeah, and I think you, we didn't get a chance to talk about your inspiration, but I know it had to do with Biden's comment about uh, the indiscriminate bombing in Gaza that got kind of caught in the sidelines. He, he wasn't, when he was at one of his uh, fundraisers. Um, yeah. You know, and, 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 and he yet, made it, as you say in the song, it's 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 not indiscriminate. It's, it's also very targeted. And we know yeah. that based on- Yeah, him. exactly, right. And and then of course he only made that comment at as you say a fundraiser that was uh, very much a campaign oriented event and and had nothing to do with you know anybody who's involved with policy making you know it was just uh, sure. just for the cameras you know for his for his base to to so they're not as alienated as they already are by his support for Israel. David, I want to ask you. You know, we've seen all around the world across the US and Europe, um, very specific efforts to call any criticism of Israel, even before October 7th, uh, anti-Semitic, uh, to, to somehow conflate anti-Semitism with criticism of the state of Israel and its policies toward the Palestinians. Uh, you have this incredible song called Anti-Semitism, which we can hear in just a moment here. But I just wanna hear from you, uh, I'm sure that you have been called an anti-Semite. And I, I just want to hear from you, uh, your take on that uh, campaign, if you will, to, to shut down any criticism of Israel, any solidarity with Palestine, uh, with this, uh, you know, the weaponization of anti-Semitism. I wonder if you could just speak to that and then Faisal, we could listen to the song, anti-Semitism. Oh yeah, I call it anti-Semite, the song. Okay. And, uh, and I, oh, and anti-Semite. Sorry, yeah, and, and also there's a great video in the, in the music videos folder. The video for it, I think, is wonderful, and it's the only the only uh, time that I've managed to inject anything that might be considered levity into this genocide is uh, this song, which is um, just about. I mean, because it's hard not to. It is comedy, no matter how tragic. It's also it can't help but be comedy because it, it, the accusations are so completely ridiculous about. Uh, and, you know, it used to be 23 years ago when when I first started writing songs about Palestine and first started getting called all sorts of names. Um, you know, they used to call me a self-loathing Jew, but now they just don't bother with that anymore. And they call everybody an anti-Semite, regardless of whether they have Jewish lineage, which like and I'm not <laughs> saying like my Jewish lineage is not like particularly, you know, it's not something I dwell on much, but it's like come on, at least don't call me, you know, at least call me a self-loathing Jew if you're going to call me, you know, names, you know, but right. uh, it's, it's been it's taken to a whole nother level, as you said, <laughs> I, the, where, the where most, Jews in Germany uh, are being arrested for, for their protests and solidarity of Palestine. Exactly. You know, and Germany is a that place persecuted Jews. I mean, it's, yes. It's, and and it this is, is where it some started. Outrage to it. Yeah, and I wrote an essay called "The German Question," which is which is you know gets into that history there. And I've spent a lot of time in Germany, and and this is where I first uh, started getting attacked as an anti-Semite by Germans, you know, uh, in mm -hmm. a group uh, the you know called the anti-Deutsch, the anti-Germans. And these are, I mean, it's a sort of complicated history, but it's a group that kind of comes out of the left originally, and then morphed into this bizarre sort of Israel supporting U.S. imperialism supporting group that uh, condemns anybody as an anti-Semite who like really, really wild stuff. Like if you criticize banks or bankers, they say that they say that's veiled anti-Semitism. You know, if you criticize, basically, mm -hmm. if you criticize capitalism, you know, you're basically an anti-Semite. You know, you, I mean, you can't you can't you can't even open your mouth without being an anti-Semite as far as these people are concerned. But their mentality, their 
their incredibly reductionist kind of orientation around, you know, what is anti-Semitism, what isn't, has completely uh, migrated across the Atlantic. And, you know, they're using exactly the same uh, kinds of, uh, you know, any anything, any kind of criticism of Israel is uh, is automatically considered anti-Semitism, you know, yeah, uh, along with all kinds of other things that that most of us would think is pretty bizarre to, to be even associating uh, these things with. I mean, it's they, they uh, it, it's particularly strange in Germany because they don't have many Jews. You know, they they sort of killed them all. So uh, they um, although more and more Israelis are you know well, they're going back Ber as Berlin I would in particular. be as, yes absolutely I would too <laughs> if I were Israeli it's a great idea get out of there go to a nice peaceful city like Berlin you know yeah absolutely yeah, we talked a lot that, about you know. that yesterday in our program we've had a couple of films about uh about what's happening in Berlin with uh with the protests and shut, you know crackdowns on that and yeah. how really to be a Jew in Germany the only acceptable Jew in Germany right now is if you're if you're pro-Israel and, and if you're not then you're just as bad as the rest of the troublemakers yeah. who are who are trying to draw attention to what's happening on the ground that's right and muslims so. are automatically suspect in germany like from this uh you know this kind of wing with the, the wing nut wing of the left that is uh pro-israel in germany you know whatever we call these people you know they uh i've heard stories from arab uh arabs in germany about how they are basically immediately being suspect as being anti-semites you know for the, for wearing a kafia or for for being Arab. And well, the kafia really is now sad. outlawed. It's it's considered inciting yeah. violence in Germany. You what, can't even wear it. it. It's a symbol of violence, not yeah, a cultural where, symbol but, of being uh, Palestinian. It, which is very strange because you can see lots of Jewish Israeli kids wearing kafias. I mean, that's like <laughs> I saw that in elementary schools in in, in Israel. You know, and I, I I did a little double take, but you know, people were like, yeah, no, they don't think it's political. It's just a scarf. Well, it just shows you how absurd and how extreme yeah. the the crackdown is. And so anyway, Faisal, you have that song ready? Should we listen? Ready and ready. Okay. Here we go. If you are a fan of democracy, if you have a problem with state theocracy, if you're having issues with minority rule or with the propaganda they teach your kids in school you don't like invading armies bent on thievery if you think it's wrong to steal someone else's country there's just one explanation though it may be getting trite you must be an anti-semite you must be an anti-semite if you don't like the idea of shooting mortar rounds at kids, it must be because you just don't like the Yids. Israel bombs hospitals, if you heard that on the news, it must be because that network doesn't like the Jews. All those UN agencies crying genocide, secretly still blame us for the way that Jesus died. There's just one explanation we keep within our sights. You must be an anti-Semite. You must be an anti-Semite. If you think free speech is a really good thing, if you fear the future that censorship may bring, if you think Mark Zuckerberg is a pawn of the CIA, if you don't believe whatever the Western leaders say, if you march and chant from the river to the sea, if you say you'll keep fighting until Palestine is free, there's just one explanation right there in black and white. You must be an anti-Semite. You must be an anti-Semite. If you're not a fan of home demolitions, if you've got some kind of problem with the Zionist position, it can't be that you care about humanity. It can't be just that you want some sanity. If you don't like the slaughter, you'd better just stand by. Don't speak out or else we'll all know the reason why. There's just one explanation, the one from the far right. You must be an anti-Semite. You must be an anti-Semite.
And David, Hello, I want David. to ask you a question. Um, mm. Any um, any complaints about the title of your album? Uh, well, notes from I mean, a Holocaust. <laughs> notes from a Holocaust. Um, yeah, so far, uh, you know, the people that uh, the people that would be complaining about it, I've probably blocked uh, on social media years ago. You know, so I I don't get much. But I mean, it's mainly not a matter of people complaining. It's that they don't hear about it in the first place. Like, I mean, where would they ever hear about this album? Anybody who doesn't like it, you know, they wouldn't. So the people who hear about it are mostly uh, people that already think the way I'm thinking, and that's why they heard about it, you know. Which is which is a, you know, which is very sad. I I mean, anytime I hear from people that really hate something I'm I'm doing, I'm really happy because I know that that means that it's getting out beyond the choir, you know. Uh, it's um, you know, that's how that's how I like what. what I, years ago when i was uh, i was they played a song of mine on venezuelan television and i immediately got all kinds of hate emails from people uh in in venezuela i i know that lots of people liked the song in venezuela but the ones with uh the ones who speak fluent english and have internet access and you know wanted to bother saying sending me an email you know I, I, they're not we're not the fans of the song and but you know i i was i yeah i love it getting hate mail but it you know usually comes with a lot more positive you know when i first wrote a song about the Pal about palestine in in 2000 when the uh, second intifada started and uh, and and ariel sharon massacred children at the al-aqsa mosque in september of 2000 I, I wrote a song about it called children of jerusalem and the first thing that happened after that was i got a lot of hate mail uh, from Israelis who were calling me a Nazi and from uh, various uh, Israel supporters uh, from the diaspora. And then in, after about a week, um, the song started getting out uh, in, among the Palestinian diaspora, and I got a much, much bigger uh, flood of, of, uh, of email back then, you know, before social media, it was all email and it, emails from Palestinians from around the world. So that's, that's kind of the kind of thing that happens if a song gets out there. Um, these days it's much more often the case that with the algorithms and everything else it's like you know people who already follow me on spotify might find it people who like similar music you know might get a recommendation and hear hear it that way but it's it's not going to be um not going to get out there easily into the the you know in uh, among the mainstream democrats and republicans and the people who need to hear it unfortunately but you have been very generous with your music and, you know, encouraging people to share the music, even use it in their own uh, videos if they're trying to draw attention to the situation on the ground. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, I know we've already uh, shared your website a couple of times. Um, you know, yeah. you're, you, you, want the, you want your songs out there and you want people to share them. And I know that they've reached all the way to Yemen, as you said, because you wrote that song about the Houthi army and... Um, people are appreciating your voice and your message. Even here today, we have a lot of really positive comments in the chat, as I'm sure you've seen. Yeah, uh, it's so here, James is writing, you're the Bob Dylan of Palestine. <laughs> That's a great one. I love so it. talk a little bit about that. And then tell us what song would you like to play for us? I don't know if you want to play another one that has like some video to it, or or you tell me what what is dear to your heart in this moment. Oh, sure. But I mean, as far as getting music out there, yeah, it's it's um it's all about uh, communicating and and getting it out there, and I and I think um, other musicians all feel the same way about it, you know, and I you know maybe there's different opinions on on um, you know the business model of Spotify or whatever, you know, I I have lots of criticisms of Spotify and that kind of thing, but but that's totally different from the desire to communicate and get your music out there, which I think is a universal thing, and um, I know also. I mean, for anybody that like, uh, I, I get frequent like people writing and saying, you know, is it okay if I sing your song or or play the song? And, and there's and just for the record, like, there's no need to ever ask a musician such a question. I mean, musicians like to hear from people who say things like that because we like to know that somebody wants to sing our song or whatever. But um, you know, once a song is out there, it is it is there for people to do things with and, and just to, uh, under international law for whatever that's worth, you know, under us law, under the laws of countries around the world. I, I, I don't think there's any exceptions. It's uh, 
there's international agreements about what happens to music that's been recorded. You can do what you want with it. You can record it. You can adapt it. You can sing it. You can, you know, so that, of course, those of us who want to really make that very clear, you know, put out song books and, and things like that. So that's, so I did a song book for all these new songs so that people who want to actually, you know, sing them can do it. They're all very simple songs. I don't really do complicated songs. So you can play four chords on a guitar in succession, you know, then you can, uh, you can manage to sing any of these songs too. And I think it's, it's also like music is, is, is a long standing way for people to communicate, not only sort of, um, you know, do a lot of things, communicate with each other, uh, do popular education, uh, have a sense of community. It's, it's important. It fulfills a lot of important functions and, um, and that can play lots of different, uh, you know, that can happen in lots of different ways, including just like by writing the songs and them being out there, they can be used by other people in all kinds of different ways, you know, and then of course, also by me, you know, physically performing at events or, or whatever, but there's just, you know, I, I encourage all of it. And, and I think that and what, I'm not alone there. What's the next one? Uh, I think, um, I guess, uh, for, if, if we're thinking about one more, I would say, um, if a song, can raise an army, which is, I think, the last song on the uh, in the videos folder there. And what is it called? Uh, if a song could raise an army, uh, well, I have airdrop as the last one. Oh, if a song, yeah, that's oh maybe okay. it's yeah yep. twenty, yeah. I'll have it ready in a minute. Yeah, and this this is the this is a song I wrote actually after the filmmaker who's been uh, doing a bunch of videos. Um, uh, basically, uh, mm -hmm. criticized me for being too wordy, and and uh, you know he said like, can you just like slow down a bit and uh, you know stop uh, you know pouring so many words into a line, and then I can make a better video. Uh, you know if if you're just a bit more sparse with your words, and so I, I just was thinking about that advice, and and I came up with what I think is uh, one of the best songs I've ever written. And uh, I thought it was it was very good advice. It's always good to tell people to slow down, probably. All right. I know that less is more sometimes. <laughs> yeah, less is yeah, less is often more. I I forget that. I mean, even even a wordy song is still is still very, um, you know, very succinct compared to many other forms of communication. But oh, you know, of course, it's, it's yeah. always good to remember that you can even boil it down to fewer words, and that and that might even more have more of an impact. So I think what I love about your music is that it evokes imagery. You know, you really can imagine <laughs> what you're singing about. That's yeah, evoking imagery and telling stories. That's what it's about. And not yeah. telling people what you, they should think or feel. I mean, I you know, even though all this stuff I think evokes lots of, you know, makes people think and feel the things that I want them to think and feel for sure, but it's sure. Uh, you know, if you don't tell them what they're supposed to think or feel, um it, it, it <coughs> have much more able to actually um think and feel for themselves right it happens organically you just open your heart yeah yeah david have you done any rap music any, any rapping i actually did a an album uh two two years ago with a wonderful uh local hip-hop artist named mike crenshaw and uh, if people can hear it on spotify the album uh um it's called take the power back um and uh yeah, it's like as far as like I I don't know if I'd call it what I have done rapping, but there's an album called um, Meanwhile in Afghanistan. Uh, I have a song about the Holy Land Five, uh, the the from the Holy Land Foundation who have been in prison now for a long long time, since 2009, and um and and the a lot of the songs on that album are uh, something that might be uh, considered rap. Um, I'll let people decide what it is. You know, I I've, I've always like most musicians rejected genre long ago but um yeah but i i love uh hip hop and and i've been very influenced by it and i think especially with that album um and the, with the album i did with mike Crenshaw, people might hear the influence okay here we go to this okay great If a song could bring us together Across the planet that gave us birth To act as one, bring peace and justice All around this shattered earth If a song could take down borders 
Take down fences, make them fall. Liberate all those imprisoned, kept behind the ghetto walls. If any song could stop the bombs, so the next might be the last. If any song could change the future, so it won't be like the past. If a song could be a missile fired from the Iron Dome, if it could protect the children, keep them safe within their homes, if a song could raise an army and transport it on command. Take us all to Palestine to defend the Holy Land. If a song could be concrete and put to use to rebuild, if it might turn back the clock, bring back all the babies killed. If a song could be a blueprint, the instructions to show us how. If a song could change the world, then let us do it now. If a song could bring us together across the planet that gave us birth, as one, bring peace and justice all around this shattered earth. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Excellent. It's been. Uh... My question for you: the the other day when I listened to your um, kind of live uh, tour of your songs, and many of them had video, is that part of the notes from a Holocaust guided tour that has a link on your website? That's right. Yeah, that was a that was a guided tour of the new album. That was what I was doing there. Yeah. Do you mind if I share that link? I encourage people to to listen oh, to no, that. Oh no, be so great. They can yeah, get to get to really sink into all of your other songs and also see all the audiovisual stuff that you've been doing. It's really incredible. So that's a link to um, just put that. David, I will be uh, posting some of your songs on our uh, Instagram uh, social media. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I'll do them one at a time, and uh, yeah, uh, great. Over time. I probably have to yes. make a better post because they to do a a reel they only allow you um like a minute 120 seconds I believe or so but it's nice to edit the little segments for that and then people who are who like it can find the full version yeah. somewhere that's, that's exactly. something I haven't gotten into At least enough. You give them yeah give them a taste of it yeah yeah well, we'll we'll do the reels then and I think that we'll do them as reels in that case so that's great. Um, great. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure having you with us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. You know, this is not this it's not a goodbye forever, like that song that that film said. Uh, yeah, we, definitely. Uh, Let's get together again. And in in the if um, anybody out there who in the in the real world, um, like uh, in Connecticut, there where you are, I'll be in the in the Northeast in, uh, in late March, early April, uh, playing in Boston and New York. And, um, and if anybody's in uh, Los Angeles, I'll, I'll be there next weekend. Actually, then, uh, yeah. Next month in France and England as well. Let me know, what date are you going to be in London? London on the 20th and 21st, uh, the Julian Assange's court trials, uh, the last possibility for him not to get extradited is uh, at the Royal Courts in London on the 20th and 21st, and I'll be doing 
uh, concerts and different pubs uh, afterwards. Uh, yeah, I may want to. I may want to talk to you. We have an exhibit uh, in London that opens on the first of February until ah. March second. And oh, I'd uh, love to do something there. Uh, we love could to. Maybe oh, have, that would be wonderful. Uh, visit the exhibit in the evening and uh, and sing a couple of songs. So I'll I'll be in touch with that once Please. we get some uh, yeah clarity on the uh, on the programming for that wonderful next month yeah february that'd be, that'd be awesome to have you sing at the uh, exhibit in uh, in london the, the gallery is called p21 and it's in the center ah, it's right near i've the... been there i did a show there that was it's a small gallery run by palestinian yes at, yeah. in the center right right in the middle of town like yeah, that's right, right in the corner from trafalgar uh, square yeah right i played a concert in there uh, years ago yeah, yeah. love to do perfect it timing yeah. yeah definitely yeah well, let's let's try to make uh make sure we do something uh together there that'd be that'd be wonderful yes please all right thank you so much well, thank, thank you so much david for being thank here you guys and for sharing so much. your songs your, your voice your story and and for all the work you're doing and unfortunately what's happening is is still ongoing as we speak and very much I, so. I, I I know that you will be inspired to write more songs on this topic I I'm sad that you will be inspired to write more songs but but thank yeah. you your your songs really do touch the heart and I think they are uh, helping get the message out in a way that goes directly to the senses so thank you so much for your work and for being here today with us Thank you, and thanks so much to all these wonderful commenters. I'm I have the I have the chat window open, and I'm watching them go by, and it's just so lovely. We, we, I know. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of love out there for you. Yeah, I will for send you guys. The yeah. when, when this is done, I'll send you the, a copy of the chat files for your record. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. And uh, okay, I'd like also thank our audience who joined us on Zoom today. And thank uh, Krista for co-hosting and uh, remind me to turn the recording on. So now we have a wonderful recording of the whole show. And uh, I would like to thank those uh, who are uh, wishing me well with my COVID. Thank you so much uh, for your concern. And I promise to uh, to get back right away. I'm, I'm back actually at work here. So <laughs> not yeah. the Faisal doesn't stop working. Nothing can stop him. So, but we hope you feel better by, by next week and hopefully you'll be completely on the mend. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, as we say at the end of uh, the programs, uh, ma salama to everybody. Ma salama. Bye-bye.